All right, well, we're going to get started back. <coughs> Let's go back in our manual. Now, this first one, we've been talking about various kinds of tongues, different reasons and purposes of tongues, and now we're going to talk about tongues specifically for personal edification. This is talking about building up and for maintenance, the number one reason for speaking in other tongues. On page 14 of your manual, it says, John Lake said, tongues are the making of my ministry. Now that's a pretty good endorsement in and of itself. That by praying in other tongues, speaking in other tongues, he said it was the making of his ministry. And, and a lot of these verses we're going to be going over and over at different times, but in Jude, chapter, well, it's only one chapter, but in verses 17, he says, But beloved, remember ye the words <clears throat> which were spoken before of the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ, how that they told you there should be mockers in the last time, who should walk after their own ungodly lusts. These be they who separate themselves, sensual, not having the spirit. Okay? Now, notice, not having, or having not the spirit. By not having the spirit, you're already labeled as sensual. That word sensual, in the Greek, it's an amazing word. It, if you Look it up. It, it is literally the word psuchikos, which is the word for soul. In other words, they are soulish. They are naturally minded. They think more of the senses. They think more with, with the feelings. They're, they're more uh, earthly minded. And he said that they are sensual. They are, they are soulish, okay? Which the Bible also tells us that even witchcraft comes out of the soul, right? It's not spiritual in that sense. Now, spirit's attached to it, but it is soulish, uh, soulish, soulishly energized, put it that way. And these people have not the spirit, but you, beloved. In other words, as opposed to these who have not the spirit. Building up yourselves on your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Ghost. Keep yourselves in the love of God, looking for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ unto eternal life. You'll notice here, too, he says that by praying, building yourselves up, and by praying in the Holy Ghost, you also keep yourself in the love of Christ. Now, this is an aspect of keeping those embers fanned in the fire, if you might say, like Paul told Timothy. This is one of the main important points of speaking in other tongues in your private life, right? It keeps you on fire, so to speak, okay? Now, the Apostle Paul said in 1 Corinthians 14, 18, I thank my God I speak with tongues more than you all. Now, <clears throat> that in itself, again, is a pretty good recommendation. Okay? But I want you to think about this. The Apostle Paul wrote at least one-third of the New Testament. Right? God, and, and of all the people in the New Testament, most people, and, and usually you don't hear people refer to Revelation in regards to the Apostle Peter even though we know he was the first person who had revelation because Jesus told him, he said, now who do you say I am? You're Christ, Son of the living God. And he says, the flesh and blood has not revealed this unto you, but it's been revealed to you by my heavenly Father. So we know that Peter was the first person to have a revelation from God, a personal revelation in that line. But whenever you mention revelation, usually you're referring to Paul. And, and the body of Paul's work was all revelational because none of it was spoken of before time, right? And if you look at what was written, actually, it's kind of funny because I've, um, I've always said that if you're going to get, after you get somebody saved, you should put them right into the book of James, which is absolutely true. And James was the first book written in the Bible, in the New Testament, right? Why? Because they needed a primer of how to live the life. And that's why they wrote it. It's a fairly small book. Then after that, the next book written was Galatians where Paul is talking about, obviously, not going back into the law and all this kind of stuff. So, but if you look at these things here, Paul's whole revelation, his entire work, was revelatory, and you can't find anything in reference to what Paul was talking about in any of the Gospels. And yet those men had walked, been with Jesus for three, three and a half, almost four years, and yet there's not one hint of it in any of their Gospels. 
Paul was the first one to start bringing that out. Now, it is not a coincidence that the man who said, I thank my God that I pray in tongues or speak in tongues more than you all, also is a man who had the most revelation of any person in the New Testament. Right? So on a personal level, praying in other tongues builds you up, but it also brings revelation, which is what builds you up. You hear that? John Lakes had called praying in tongues the dynamo of the Spirit. In John Lakes' day, the, uh, the idea or the time was that electricity was just starting to be really common. And back then, they had these dynamos that you could go watch. And as they turned these things, they would generate electricity. And then the electricity would be transferred through wires into a battery and to store it. And so they would, he would watch those things and he would see, and you always see, if you ever seen any of the old uh, Frankenstein movies, I mean, when they start to reanimate, you know, the Frankenstein, they turn these things, you see the electricity sparks flying off of it. And that was really kind of how it was in, in Lake's day. And he said, when he saw that, he said, that's what speaking in tongues is in the spirit. He said, what the dynamo is for electricity in the natural, praying and speaking in other tongues, that's what praying and speaking in other tongues is, is in the spirit realm, in that it develops and becomes a way of charging up that it is then stored in a battery. Now, see, most people want to wait till they have a problem, and then they want to run to God and say, God, help me, and they expect him to drop power on them at that point. God has put himself in you and given you the ability to charge your batteries and have them charge so when the need is at hand, you can release it at will rather than having to hope that God's going to show up, you release him, wow. right? That's one of the things, again, um, that is why this teaching, it's pretty much like all of our teachings, especially in healing and things like that, is different from what you hear in the church as a whole is because I've studied Dr. Lake's material on it, and by far he was the most advanced in the church in the last hundred years concerning the things of the Spirit, even to the point where he called it the, the, even the science of the Spirit, to where he, he broke it down into pieces, analyzed it in the Bible with his experience, and, and was able to define it in a way that I've not heard anybody else talk about it. And so in going with that, and now we should be able to take this further, so that's why I'm bringing it out as I am, because it has been lost to the church, to the biggest majority, and it's time that the church bring it back in because it is the power of God dwelling in us that God put in us to, so that we can do what he's called us to do. But to do that, we have to know how to use it. And now the purpose of the spirit dwelling in you is to charge up so that you can draw this charge so that you can release it at will. Again, quoting John Lake again, he said that any person who claims to be a minister of God should be able to manifest the Spirit of God at will at the point of need. Right? That's what you see in the book of Acts. And so that's what we're trying to do here is to get this into the church as a whole to where you can begin to build yourself up so that rather than, you know, as we would say many times, just hoping and praying when we're in a bad situation, we can actually stand there in faith and boldly say what our God will do through us. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Now, here he says, and, and again, not just quoting Lake, but in, on uh, page 15, in Isaiah 28, 12, we already talked, I'm going to keep, uh, keep bringing this back in, reiterating it. This is the rest wherewith you may cause the weary to rest, and this is the refreshing. So anytime you just get wore out, anytime you're going through your daily life, anytime things get too hectic, just take a few minutes, Pray in tongues, take a walk, pray in tongues under your breath or out loud or however you want to do it, and you will be refreshed, you'll be rested, and you can come back in, all right? Speaking in other tongues provides a rest and refreshing. Smith Wigglesworth was once asked why he did not take vacations or holidays, as the English would say then. He replied, I do. I take a holiday every day. I pray in other tongues, and I'm refreshed and rested and ready to continue working in the Father's vineyard. Amen? I'm absolutely convinced one of the main reasons many ministers get burned out is because they don't pray in tongues enough. All right? If the apostle, the apostle Paul made some very blunt statements. He said, I thank my God that I pray in tongues more than you all. I speak in tongues more than you all. Right? 
Then later on, he even says, I've labored more abundantly than all the other apostles. Think there may be some correlation there? You see? If what we do is the ministry of the Spirit and by the Spirit, then by us building ourselves up in the Spirit, it should make us more efficient, more proficient, and more effective in ministry of the Spirit. Amen? There is a reason to pray in tongues. Okay? Next, Galatians 6, 9. We've already read that. Let us not be weary in well-doing, for in due season we shall reap if we faint not. 2 Thessalonians 3.13 says, But you, brethren, be not weary in well-doing. What is he telling them? Pray in tongues. That's not all he's saying. Obviously, he's saying just don't be weary. But how do you not be weary? Pray in tongues. All right? Then we actually talked about this, and we're going to go into it here. Often in long battles, we, be, we may become tired and tempted to let up or relax. Praying in other tongues will bring the needed renewal and refreshing that is able to carry you through. Praying in other tongues causes the rivers of living water to flow through you, bringing the rest and the refreshing. Now, take your Bible and go with me to John chapter 7. John chapter 7. And look at verse 37. It says, In the last day, that great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried, saying, If any man thirst, let him come unto me and drink. He that believeth on me, as the scripture has said, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. All right, now let's just look at this. Let's take this apart piece by piece. Number one, if any man thirst, let him come unto me and drink. Right? So who's responsible for getting filled? We are. we are. Amen? You come to him and you drink. Now, we already know that he said if you come to him and you drink, you will no longer thirst. Isn't that right? <clears throat> so all this stuff about can, you know, just always being thirsty, no, we don't need that. Right? Now, I'll prove it on this next point. Verse 38 he that believeth on me, as the scripture has said, now watch, out of heaven shall... <laughs> is that not what it says? It doesn't say heaven, does it? it? doesn't say it's going to fall out of heaven. Your refreshing doesn't come from heaven. Do you get that? People say, well, we're just waiting for times of refreshing that God will rain refreshing on us. It doesn't say that. It doesn't say that at all. It doesn't have to fall on you. It has to come out of you. If it, it, listen, if it was up to God, it would already be done. But it's not up to God, it's up to you. It's out of your belly has to flow rivers of living water. So if you're not walking in these rivers of living water, if it's not flowing out, guess what? It's not, not, not God's fault. It is your fault, right? You say, well, I don't understand. I've just grown cold toward God. I can understand it. You are not letting the rivers that are in you out. Right? Now, he says, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. Okay? Where is it coming from? Out of your belly. Right? Why? Because that's where he came into. Isn't that right? Now he's a temple. You're the temple. Your body is the temple. He dwells within you. He is with you and shall be in you. So now he is in you. And now the key is not getting him to come down upon you. The key is getting him to come out of you. Right? And you're the reason. <laughs> I love studying the Bible. <laughs> Let me read this again. Let me go back here. Hang on a second. Let's see if I can find it real quick. Yeah, yeah, I don't have it here. Hang on. It's the one we've been quoting all along so far. I find it on every page. Now it's not here. <laughs> go figure. You know what? I know right where it's at. <laughs> there we go. <clears throat> Isaiah 28:11. For with stammering lips and another tongue will he speak to this people. You know the word lips there? You know what that is? That's the Hebrew word. It means literally one of two things, depending on how you intend it. One way, it can mean a spout out of which something flows. Your lips are a spout out of which flow rivers of living water. You know what the other definition of that word is? A dam. So your, your mouth, your lips, with stammering lips, he's going to speak to another nation. So these lips are going to become a spout. And if they're not a spout, they're a dam. You get it? 
So the spirit, the rivers of living water, what stops rivers? It's your lips, which is the dam of the living waters that want to flow out of you, out of your belly. It doesn't flow out here. It flows up and out through your lips, right? It even gives the idea, when it talks about lips, it even gives the idea of a shoreline, right? So in other words, as far as your lips pour out this water, that's the shoreline of these rivers of living water. You get that? So that's how I love studying the Bible. And then you get down to it, it's, it's neat how it all fits together. All right, now, let me get back over to where I was. Now I lost my place here. There we go. Okay, we're in John chapter 7, verse 38. He that believeth on me, as the scripture has said, has said, out of his belly shall flow rivers, plural, rivers of living water. You get that? So the living water is there. That's the spirit, because, okay, let's read the rest part. Just so you make sure you know. But this, verse 39, but this spoke he of the Spirit. You hear that? So we're talking about the Spirit, right? So the Spirit has to come out of your lips as living water. You get that? Now, how does the Spirit come out of your lips? Right? Well, obviously, it can come out in Scripture, because he said, my words are Spirit, and they are life. So you can speak his, his words, and they come out. But he said, out of your belly will flow rivers Plural. That, now, rivers is not, it doesn't say we'll flow a river. It's rivers plural. That means there are several ways for the Spirit to come out of your mouth in different forms. Your normal language, tongues, right? And in the tongues, there are several rivers of tongues. Maintenance tongues, warfare tongues, intercessory tongues, uh, all, the, you know, all these different ways. Do you get it? So what I'm trying to emphasize is that the Spirit of God in you wants to come out in various rivers. It does not say river single, singular. It has rivers plural. The Spirit will come out of your belly, belly, out of your belly, <laughs> out of your belly, okay, in various ways. All right? Now, obviously in your normal language, it, that's one river. But there are rivers plural. So if you are only letting the Spirit out through your normal language, you are operating in a river and not rivers. You get that? So you are not fulfilling Scripture. Okay? He says, But this spoke he of the Spirit, which they that believe on him should receive, for the Holy Ghost was not yet given, because that Jesus was not yet glorified. Right? So he is pointing to a future time at this point that once he was glorified, then the Spirit could come and then the men could receive it, right? So he is talking about the day of Pentecost whenever, and, and, and this is another way that there could be rivers coming out, is that each of those people that heard them, heard them speak in their own language, so each language could be a river, yeah. right? So I'm just trying to lay this whole thing out to let you see there is, an, there is a depth to this that the church as a whole does not walk in. Right? There is much more to it. There's much more to living and walking in the Spirit than just coming to church on Sunday right? and having a few songs and maybe even praying in tongues a little bit and going on. It's deeper than that. Right? This has to do with your entire life. The, purpose, the reason Jesus came was so that the Spirit could abide in us. And the reason the Spirit came to abide in us is so that He could get out of us Amen. and infect the world. All right? Now, let's move on here. Notice, where are we at? Is that it? Yeah, okay. Notice number five on page 16. Okay, watch my time here. Now we're going to talk about tongues and interpretation. This is one aspect of it. Now if you look in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, we said last night, and we gave the, the uh, description up here, the little what graphic, what do you want to call it, that there is diversities of tongues, and then there is interpretation of tongues. Now, this was given, and, and actually if you go through John Lake's material, there is a lot, almost every sermon has a tongues and interpretation in it. Same thing with Smith Wigglesworth. And as a matter of fact, that was the way it usually was in the early days. We've, we've, a lot of that has ceased now because of television and because people don't want to be seen as, in their idea of backwards, they let people watch them, and so they have to clean up 
their program rather than just keeping it real before God. So one of the things that I've, we have shifted from on Sunday is that when we first started, we didn't have a congregation in front of us. We just broadcast over the Internet. So it was very, obviously very Internet driven in the sense that we were speaking to a camera and there was just a couple other people in the room that were actually running the cameras. And I didn't want to keep it that way. We wanted a live congregation and we wanted to make sure that, and when we first started, the live congregation was, it was as if they were sitting in on a TV broadcast, right? And I didn't like that because it's too sterile. You know, it's just, here we are doing the broadcast, time's up, quit, that kind of thing. And what we want is for the congregation to be here and we just turn on the camera and it just goes and whatever you get, they get, right? Rather than gearing it toward a particular broadcast or something like that. We just, we want the Spirit of God. So, because we never know who's watching by internet, but it shouldn't matter, right? You preach what God gives you to preach. You do what God leads you to do, and you just walk in that. And if somebody watches and they like it, great. And if they don't, tough, right? Why? Because we're responsible before God what we do. And we shouldn't do anything here that we'd be ashamed to do anywhere else, amen? So, that's why we've shifted the way we're doing the Sunday services even now, and it's, more fellowship and more, uh, well, just not as sterile as it was before. So, but in tongues and interpretation being one aspect of this. Now, most people, when they pray in other tongues, they don't interpret it, and they just pray. But, you know, it, it says if, if you do speak in other tongues, pray that you can interpret. Now, that is talking, at that case, specifically about a congregational type meeting. But, it does not say that you can't, if you can interpret that, you can interpret any of it, right? One of the things you'll notice is that all the gifts, when they are, when you receive a gift, meaning, and I, and I really want to get away from the idea of, okay, here's a, you know, I give you this gift, it's this thing that I give you here, there you go. But we have to realize that these gifts are manifestations of the Spirit. The only thing that hinders His manifestation usually is you're not knowing the will of God concerning that. Your faith cannot go beyond your knowledge of the will of God. Once you know what the will of God is, then you can step out in faith in that area. So once you are aware of how the Spirit of God can manifest himself, and once you experience that, then from then on, you can step out in faith and experience, and experience that at any time. That's why gifts of healings can operate any, anywhere. Working of miracles can operate anywhere. And, and usually you'll see people when they start out, it's kind of hit and miss. And the longer they do it, the better they get at it. Why? Because they, their faith builds in a way to where they start to expect God to be there whenever they get ready. And then they step out into it. And it's the same thing. It's the same thing with prophecy. It's the same thing with healing. It operates the same way. Now, we don't really concern ourselves with gifts. We concern ourselves with we do what God has told us to do and we help people. The gift aspect, the manifestation of the Spirit is up to God, right? But we can rely on Him to manifest because He is God and He is very predictable. He will do exactly what he said he will do, right? Now, the fact that we believe he will do what he said he will do is our part of faith, right? So see, it all comes together. So whenever you have experienced something, when you experience it, you can use it even if you backslid. It, 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 once you experience God in a certain way and you know what he'll do, if you know that God loves people and that he wants people well, he does not want people sick, then... You can minister to people. And then if you backslid, what you still know God loves people. And you still know that God doesn't want people sick. And you could still pray for people and they could still get healed because your faith in God for his love for them is still just as strong even though your walk with him isn't as close as it was before. See, that's why many times, usually by the time you hear of some preacher falling, that ain't the day he fell. Right? It's usually way before that, and he's on this path downward. Right, And then finally, it catches up. So it's not that God just puts up with it or that God hides it or anything. Usually God is slow to jump on something because he gives you time to turn around. And usually after it's so long a time before, he actually exposes something. Right, And when he does expose it, it is not to get at the person he's exposing. It is pr to protect the body and hopefully turn that person around. Yeah. Right? So that's why you can take a person that operates in a gift, but then 
even if they backslide, the gift still works. Why? Because they still have to step out in faith and they still know what they knew before, right? So yeah, that's good and bad, okay? It's good for the people, but many times if the, if the ministry, and believe it or not, they're not all trained in this, if they don't recognize that, then they think, well, I must still be okay with God because he's still healing people when I pray for them. And in reality, they're not still okay with God. Right. It's just that God loves people, right? So once you experience God in a certain way, in, in one of these various manifestations, it gets very easy to experiencing, experience him that way from then on, pretty much at will. So the key is getting that first experience, getting that first time where you go, okay, God is using me to do this. So if you can, uh, if, 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 if you've been used in, to interpret a message in tongues in church, that wasn't just a one-time thing. You may have been taught, well, the Spirit came on you and interpreted, and now he's gone. That's not true. The Spirit abides within you. He does not leave. He is still there. That same Spirit that allowed you to interpret that is still there, and last time he may have initiated it, but now once you experience it, now you can initiate it. See, that's one of the problems with the revival movement. Everybody thinks it's up to God to send revival. Well, the first time revival breaks out, people may go, wow, that was awesome. But from then on, now they're responsible to stay revived. Right? It's not a matter of, okay, well, that was good, now it's gone, let's just sit back and wait until another wave comes around. No. It, see, this goes back to um, John 9, 5. Yeah, 5. Uh, the Pool of Bethesda, where... John, where Jesus hears about the man at the pool, and it said that at a certain season, an angel came down and troubled the water. And they were all waiting for the water to get troubled. But do you realize that the whole time they were sitting around waiting for the water to get troubled, the one who was sending the angels to trouble the water was walking around out in the temple and out and around? They could have went to him and got healed any time. Right? They didn't have to wait till the water was troubled. Our problem is we want to wait for the troubling of the water rather than be connected with the one that can trouble the water any time and keeps it troubled. You get that? So the key for us, he says, out of your belly shall flow rivers of living water. That's the troubling of the water. If the water is, if living water is coming out of you, guess what? It's troubled. Okay? What the, all that means is, you know, you stir the water up. That's all it means. That's why he tells you, you stir up the Holy Spirit that's in you. You stir up the water that's in you. And when you stir up the water, it's troubled. People get healed. Blessing comes out. Tongues come out. Interpretation comes out. All these things start to happen because you decided to cooperate with God who is always on. Amen? Amen. Now, here John Lake, in, uh, John Lake went to Africa in May of 19, actually left here in April, on April 1st of 1908. And it took him about six weeks to get there and he got into Cape Town uh, in, uh, well, I believe it was May 14th of uh, 1908. He and his family had seven children, his wife, he had two other people that were with him. And so when they got there, they were in Africa uh, for about six months. And on December 22nd, his wife passed away there. And a lot of controversy to it, a lot of different reasons, all that kind of stuff, but don't have time to get into it now. But during that time, he called that, her death, he called it Satan's master stroke because they were so in love and they were so connected. And here he's got children. He's got seven children with him. The youngest at the time was 18 months old. And here he is in a foreign country, no backing, nobody to support him, nothing. And his wife passes away while he's off on a trip, and he comes back to find out they've already buried her. And now he's got seven kids, and there's some other problems going on with the kids even at one point. And so it, it really affected him as, as it would. And he begins, as usual, praying in tongues a lot, spending a lot of time with God in tongues. And then God gave him, in tongues and interpretation, this message. And he wrote it down, and he, he called it guidance. And it's a, an interpretation of a message in tongues that was given to him privately while he was praying in other tongues. And it says, and you can read it there on page 16, it says, O soul on the highway from earth unto glory, Surrounded by mysteries, trials, and fears. Let the life of thy God in thy life be resplendent. For Jesus will guide thee, thou needst never fear. For if thou wilt trust me, I'll lead thee and guide thee. Through the quicksands and deserts of life all the way. No harm shall befall thee, 
I only will teach thee to walk and surrender with me day by day. For earth is a school to prepare thee for glory. The lessons here learned you will always obey. When eternity dawns, it will only be the morning of life with me always as life is today. Therefore be not impatient as lessons thou art learning. Each day will bring gladness and joy to thee here. But heaven will reveal to thy soul of the treasure which infinitude offers through ages and years. For thy God is the God of the heaven, of the earth and heavens, and thy soul is the soul he died to save. And his blood is sufficient, his power eternal. Therefore rest in thy God both today and always. Now, you'll notice here that what he was praying out in tongues and then prayed out the interpretation of was the Spirit of God praying through him and is glorifying God. Is it not? Magnifying God, glorifying God. Yet, at the same time, it is comforting, exhorting, right, him and, and helping him cope with the situation he was going through. Now, notice, this isn't a message that was given to him by somebody else. He is praying in tongues, to God, magnifying God, and in the process of magnifying God, God is talking to him and answering the need of his situation. He is getting, through his own prayer and in, uh, in tongues and interpretation, the answer, the solace, the, the, the comfort that he is needing, and no one else is bringing it to him. It is coming out of the rivers of living water that's coming out of himself back to himself. Right? Now, if you look at David, it said that when... David went, remember when he came back and his lands and all their city was burned and all, the, the, all of his soldiers, all of his uh, mighty men of valor, all their wives were taken captive and their sons and their daughters were taken away captive. And it said the men cried and all of them cried and they cried till they could cry no more tears. And then it said after that, and David began to encourage himself in the Lord. So they, they went through the process of grieving. Grieving is normal. They, they cried. They did everything. But then it came to a point, and notice it didn't say, and the men gathered around David and said, don't worry, David, we'll go get him back. We're, no, the men were ready to kill him. They said, look what you've done to us. Look what you've brought us to. We were out fighting for you, and now our families are gone. And instead, David had no one there that, that was coming to him and encouraging him, so he said he encouraged himself in the Lord. And the way he did that, if you look back, it was a psalm that he began to write and sing to himself to encourage himself and as he sang the psalm it talked about how his God was with him how he'd gone through troubles but his God was with him and his God would overcome and he would continue to serve God all the days of his life and so that came by inspiration I'm not saying, saying David spoke in other tongues or anything else I'm just saying that the spirit of God with David began to flow out of him to encourage himself because there was no one else there to do it Right? So whenever you think you're alone, whenever you think you've got no one to encourage you, you always have you. Amen? And in you, you can pull out the wisdom, the counsel, the encouragement, the comfort of God by the Spirit, by praying in other tongues, and then stopping at a point. And the Bible is very clear. If you want a gift, you desire it. You go after it. You seek it. And all these gifts, they are manifestations of the Spirit, and He wants to manifest Himself. And he will manifest himself to you for your need, for yourself, as well as for anybody else. Now, and, and again, just because, well, not even, I'm not even going to say that at this point. Back in the 70s, late 60s, early 70s, Oral Roberts went to a certain part of Tulsa. And at that time, they told he had made all kinds of decisions that everybody said, oh, this is going to cost you the ministry, and this is going to be this, and all that. And he went to a certain area of Tulsa and started walking around, and he said he'd been, he prayed in tongues all his life, he was a Pentecostal preacher. And as he wandered around, actually, he prayed in tongues quite a bit, and then at one point, he said while he was praying in tongues, he ended up in this certain part of Tulsa, and started, got out, and started walking around this field, and was praying in tongues. And then he stopped, and said, what, what am I doing here? And then he started saying, I need the interpretation of these tongues, what's going on? And he prayed out the interpretation, and the interpretation he described all of ORU. Wow. And he built, every time he had a problem, they would say, what are we going to do about this? We can't get this, we can't do this. He said, hang on, I'll get back with you. 
And then he would go and he would pray in tongues and then he would pray out the interpretation. He would tell them the interpretation, which would be the answer for, for the problem, and then they would move on. And for 30 some odd years, he did that very thing of praying in tongues, interpreting it, and doing business according to the interpretation of the tongues. Right? So <clears throat> that's how ORU was built. And, and very honestly, personally, and I'm you know, not saying anything negative toward him, I'm just saying I believe that a lot of the problems that ORU experienced in the latter years was because there was a ceasing of tongues and interpretation of the guidance of God of what to do, right? And so, you know, nothing against him, right? But there comes a time if you surround yourself with the wrong kind of people and you start getting wrong counsel, then you will move toward business more than ministry. And when you do that, things change. The, the, you have to understand what gets you where you're going or, or what, what gets you where you are at that point may not always be the exact same thing that will get you to the next point, but you never totally change direction. In other words, what you started with, you stay with. You stay with the same idea because that is how God uses you in that area. So there's a lot of things that even what we're doing. My, my purpose in the, in the Bible school... Uh, my goal was never to have a Bible school that was accredited or, in a sense, uh, had anything to do with anybody saying, okay, you're a Bible school. Right? It had nothing to do with that. The whole purpose was to equip ministers for the field as quickly as possible. Mm -hmm. And people that want degrees and things, there's other schools for that. Because right? <laughs> we, we're not doing that. We are building a school, and my purpose is not really my goal, is to get to a place where I don't charge tuition. I don't like tuition. I believe that's why these meetings, we don't charge a, a fee to come to these meetings. They're open. Anybody can come to them. And so we don't charge a fee for being here. That's the way I want the Bible school to be. I want it to be on a donation basis. I really don't want to have to charge tuition and stuff because we want the message to get out, and we want to train people. And so... We're in the process of, of setting it up that way. I'm, 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 that is not the conventional business wisdom of how to do things. But it is spiritual. And, and it's not about how much you know, money we can acquire or anything else. Honestly, generally pretty much what I feel about it, as long as I can get where I'm going next and you know, generally get to eat a meal every now and then, and you know, pretty regular actually, and, uh, <laughs> and, and you know, have a roof over my head if I need it or whatever, that's good. You know? Um, my purpose is not to see how much I can acquire, but to see how far I can go in the spirit realm, but also how much I can accomplish for the kingdom of God. Amen. So it's not about how much money I have, it, it's what we can do. Amen. Amen? So that's the purpose. And that's why we're pushing things to do things a little bit different. So if sometimes we seem like we don't know what we're doing, it's because we don't. <laughs> All right? It's, that's why. And, but we're, we're finding out by the spirit as we move forward. Because I... I look at the church world, and if the church is supposed to produce Jesus, it hasn't. So why would I want to do things the way they've done them? Right? That's the beauty of the situation we're in, is we can do things the way we see them in the Bible and the way we know that God wants us to do it because we want to fulfill Ephesians. We want to make sure that we, we help present to Christ a, a pure, glorious, spotless, without wrinkled church. Right? But you're not going to do that by copying things that other people have done that produce the wrong results. Right. So we are, we're blessing it. Now, let's, uh, oh, no, we're good. We got five minutes. We're good. Yes, because I'm going to get into some of these things because I really want to get to the practical application aspect of it. So uh, num point number six here on page 17. We are looking at tongues and intercession. Right? We looked at tongues and interpretation. All these things we're going to experience this evening as we move into this stuff and you start getting into it. But now notice, this has to do with groaning, crying out, weeping, and travailing. So we're going to talk about these things. In Romans chapter 8, verse 26, it says, Likewise, the Spirit also helpeth our infirmities, for we know not what we should pray for as we ought. And notice it says, we know not. Now, it's funny because the Apostle John says that we know all things later. Okay, that was written later. So Paul here, what he's talking about is he's saying we don't know. When he uses the word know here, he's talking about we don't know with our mind. 
but we do know with the mind of the Spirit. Now, the deal is to get what's in the mind of the Spirit into our mind. That's called renewing the mind. Now, one way to do that, I mean, there's all kinds of aspects that fit together, but one way to do that, and I'm absolutely convinced the best way, is by praying in tongues and interpreting that out. Because Now, watch what he says. But the Spirit himself maketh intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. So the Spirit of God himself is making intercession for us because we don't know how we ought to pray for things, right? So he has to pray for things. Now, how is he going to pray for these things except because he, he is in us and he knows us? He actually says this. And he, verse 27, and he that searches the hearts knows what is the mind of the Spirit because he makes intercession for the saints according to the will of God. Now, notice we have always looked at this as an outward thing. Okay, we're going to intercede and we're going to pray in other tongues and intercede by the Spirit for other people. And sometimes you get into what people would call a spirit, a spirit of intercession. And you start praying and say, well, I wonder who that was for. Because you don't know who it was for. Okay? There are times, and it's good if about 90% of your praying and intercession in tongues is for other people. You can direct your tongues toward a situation. You, you say, I, you know, I don't know what the problem is here. I don't know what's going on. Something ain't right. They're calling for help or whatever it is. I don't know what the problem is. So, boy, you don't know how to pray. How do you pray? You pray in tongues. So I am going to pray in tongues, and I am purposely going to direct it toward that situation because God knows what that situation is. So then you start praying in tongues, and you intercede. And the thing is, you'll start praying that way, and it'll take on a life of its own. In other words, it'll move into other areas, and sometimes you'll even know what it's about in their life. Depends on how much God can trust you. The more God can trust you to keep secrets, the more he will reveal secrets. If you've got to blab everything God shows you about other people's lives, he probably won't show you much. He'll probably just keep it in tongues and he won't have a clue of what's going on. Right? Whenever I was, in, again, in Africa in 97, we got stopped by a... Um, they were government troops, actually. And they put us in the back of a truck. It's me and another pastor. And as we were driving, we'd already seen there were several cars, open doors, things strewn out. Uh, they were shooting people. It was a bad situation. We did not know if we were going to be shot, didn't know what they were going to do to us, what, the, what their plan was. We didn't understand them. And so we're driving this truck. That was in, I was in Kenya at the time. And at that exact same t time, it was uh, daytime there, but it was nighttime here. At that exact moment when we were put in the truck and we were going to be driven some distance, and again, not knowing if they were going to take us over a hill somewhere and take us out and shoot us, I had about $3,000 in cash on me, which at that point, the average yearly salary for people in that area was about $300. So that was like a 10-year pension plan for somebody. So we didn't know what was going on. And at that exact moment, my wife was awakened here in the States and began praying in tongues for me and knew it was for me, but didn't know the situation we were in. <clears throat> well, at that point, they took me to the, well, they took me straight to the airport and then they went back to the guest house where we were staying, and they gathered all my stuff, which is never a good feeling when somebody else gathers your stuff, and brought it to the airport and then made me buy a ticket out early and made me get out. And so when I got back, we started talking about the situation, and my wife was telling about it, and I was telling her what was going on, and then we started comparing notes, and the exact time that I was in the, put in the truck and started to be driven, me and that pastor started praying in tongues, but my wife was awakened, and she began praying in tongues. And I firmly believe that because of that incident, we were spared. I believe that was intercession. She did it for me. We were doing it for us. And I believe that's why we were spared at that time. So we've seen all kinds of incidents like that. Now, but sometimes your intercession will be for other people. Sometimes there will be, and the ways it comes is that you, at some point you're just going to have to trust God that what is happening is him. Because as you're praying in other tongues, your mind will try to wander, you know, which is okay because your mind is not involved. It says that you pray with your spirit, but your understanding is, you know, not, it, it's unprofitable. So it's, or, or it's unfruitful at that point. Now, as you're praying in other tongues, you may get what I like to call like flashes. You may get uh, just like a, a picture, just, just boom, it's gone. But the split second that you see it, you know everything about it. You, you, you see, there's a split second where it just kind of flashes. It's like looking at a picture, but it's like it's, it's as if you took a picture out of your photo album. 
you can take that picture out, somebody else looks at it, and to them, all they see is the picture. If you look at it, you can see what's not in the picture, because you were there. Right? Okay, so when you're praying in other tongues, and this picture flashes, you may see just this picture at that point, but it's like you know the whole situation that you were there. But it'll be just for a moment. I mean, just a split second, just hits, boom. And it's like an instant download where you know everything about that situation, and that is the Spirit of God showing you what you're praying about. Okay? So that's why it's good to keep your mind focused and not let it just wander. Because the, the mind, the carnal mind, the unrenewed part of your mind, wars against the spirit. Isn't that what he tells us? So as the unrenewed mind wars against the spirit, he's going to try to, your unrenewed mind is going to be unruly. Right? Whenever you decide, I'm going to pray in tongues, your mind's going to go, oh, I don't want to do that. You know, I want to go watch this TV program, or I want to go, you know, and you start, you have to start to discipline yourself to say, okay, I'm going to pray in tongues, and I'm going to do it for an hour. And you say, okay, and you think, an hour? I can do it for an hour. And you get to praying, and man, you'll be going, and you're praying in tongues. And then you go, okay, five minutes? <laughs> oh, okay, and then you'll go again, right? But the key is to build up, and maybe you don't start with an hour, okay? You start with five minutes, and then you go to ten minutes, and you build it up over a period of time to where you can keep that same intensity over a period of time. Now, whenever you're praying, the problem is, as you're praying in tongues, as soon as you set yourself, okay, I'm going to go pray in tongues, and you get there and you start praying. Everything in the world, because your mind is not involved, right? And because of that, everything in the world will come into your mind. You know, you'll be sitting there praying in tongues, and I mean, as soon as you start praying in tongues, did I turn the stove off? Is the stove off? I better go check this. It, it, everything tries to draw you out to stop you from doing that to get back into the natural. Why? Because the carnal part of your mind is still controlled by Satan. Right? It still thinks in line with this world, which is at enmity against God. And the devil does not want to give up any ground. And he does not want you to get further in the spirit. He wants to keep you like Jude said, sensual, soulish, in the soul realm, in the reasoning realm. Why? Because when you're reasoning, the devil can help direct you. Because yeah. he can give you reasons. Right? He can give you things that make sense. Mm -hmm. It's just logical. It's just logical to think this way. But God doesn't think logical. Yeah. Right? He thinks spiritual. Yeah, right. And he'll tell you to do... John Lake gave the story once. He said, I was driving down the road, and the Spirit of God spoke to me. And see, you, you have to realize when you read, what people don't realize, when they read the sermons and messages given by John Lake, as I said before, they were all usually prayed out in tongues first and interpreted. But even whenever he gives instances in his life, he may not mention tongues, but that instance was a result of praying in tongues. Right? Now, he said he was driving around, he was in uh, Oregon, and he said he was coming around this corner, and there was, it's, it's two lane road going around the mountain. And he said, as I was going around this corner, he said, I heard the Spirit of God telling me to get on the wrong side of the road, to get over on the other side of the road. And actually, he was going around this way, I think it was, and he said he had to go around this way. But he said, as, as that Spirit, as the Spirit, as the voice of God told me to go on the wrong side of the road, he said, now, logically, that made no sense. Because if there was a car coming around the other side, we would hit head on. He said, but I've heard that voice so many times that I knew instantly to obey it. And he said, so I did. I switched lanes and got over it. And he said, right after I switched lanes, a truck come around the corner that was in the wrong lane. And had I stayed in the right lane, had I reasoned it out, he said, we would have hit head on. But because I listened to the voice of the Spirit and did what I was told, I was in the other lane and I missed the truck. And he said, then I got back over. Now, but the reason he heard the Spirit of God was because he was sensitive to the Spirit which came about due to praying in other tongues. Speaking in other tongues, another benefit, you might want to write this down here. Speaking in other tongues, another benefit of speaking in other tongues is that it keeps you and makes you sensitive to the Spirit of God. You will become more sensitive. You will start, I'm not talking about getting weird, okay? But it will make you sensitive and you will do things. <clears throat> One of the things I've noticed in my own life, especially over the last couple of years, is that I let things happen a lot more 
than I did when I was starting out. And what I mean by letting things happen is that I trust God that he is directing my steps. And it, it just, this is one of the things that really annoys my wife. Okay? I'm not kidding. Because <laughs> I'll say, I'm going to do this. Well, why are you going to do that? I don't know. I, you know I, I mean, I'm not saying I hear the voice of God. Right? I'm just saying, I don't know. It's just this is what I want to do. And she'll say, well, but it makes no sense. I said, yeah, I know. Well, why, why would you stop here as opposed to there? You always go here, and you're going to stop there. Why would you stop there? I don't know. I just did. You know? And when I do, then there's somebody there, and we talk. And here lately, it's been it's funny because now I go in places, and I'll stop there, and somebody go, you're Craig Blake. I'm like, really? You know, am I? I say, are you sure? <laughs> you know? I said, yeah. And then we start talking, but they know me. And if I had not, if I'd stopped where I normally stop, I wouldn't have seen them, and I wouldn't have been able to talk with them. And usually, it's, there's a prayer involved, okay? And so I don't get to do that. But it's gotten to be that way more often. But it's almost always in places that I don't normally go. It's almost always, as we would say, accidental. You know, isn't it, wasn't that a coincidence? No, that was God directing my steps. You see? So, and I believe that was very similar to the way Jesus operated. That he went about. He had certain things in certain places he had to be. But pretty much, he wandered around. You know, in his mind, he wandered. But yet, at the same time, in the overall plan of God, he was right where he was supposed to be when he was supposed to be there. So, see, our problem is we try to figure things out and say, well, that doesn't make sense, so I'm not going to do that. Well, sometimes it's the not making sense part that is the, your best testimonies, right? So, and I'm not telling you to just kind of float around. I'm saying that as you pray in tongues, you'll be sensitive, and it's easier for the Spirit of God to maneuver you into places, and you don't even know he's doing it till afterwards, right? It's kind of like the old saying, uh, what, luck, where luck meets uh, success is where luck meets preparation, the opportunity meets preparation, whatever it is. It's kind of the same thing. You know, it's like, well, the more, uh, the more you practice, the better you get at something. And, and the whole idea is that with the Spirit, the more sensitive you are, the more things work out right. And then people go, wow, look at your life. Your life is blessed. It is blessed. And the reason it's blessed is because I'm more sensitive to the Spirit of God to where I, I moved. Now, to me, I don't feel any different than I've ever felt. You know, I don't hear voices. I don't hear the voice of God saying, turn here, go there. With me, it's more because of, of my study of the Word of God and my understanding of the Word of God to where now I firmly believe that he that's joined to the Lord is one spirit with the Lord, that we are one together. I believe he can tell me to turn, and I'll feel like it's me wanting to. Why? Because we're in this together. It's, see, usually why, why people notice God is talking to them is that God will say, if we're, okay, this is supposed to be God, and this is you, all right? And you're going down the road, and God says, I want you to turn here and go that way. And because you don't, maybe you're not sensitive to it, you try to keep walking forward, and God says, I'm saying we're turning. Okay, that hit is, oh, you want me to go this way. You see, the reason you notice it is because you bump into God. But if you're yoked with him, you don't bump into him. He starts to turn, and you start to turn automatically because his yoke is your yoke, and you walk together. You see that? There is a, a oneness of walking together. But that sensitivity to that comes through speaking in other tongues and doing it on a regular basis in your normal life, not just whenever you have a crisis. Most people only pray in tongues or only pray to God when they're in a crisis. When everything's good, they just leave things alone. Well, if everything's good, they could be a lot better if you continue to pray in tongues, right? God's best is not to get, just get you out of, from one crisis to the next. God's best is that you walk with him and avoid the crises, right? And then if you find yourself in a crisis, you know that the reason you're there is to help somebody else usually, right? So, okay. Got to say, ooh, yes, go to break. Sorry, <laughs> go to break. <laughs>